All right, thanks very much, Dennis. Um, you know, when I told my parents that I was giving this talk, I knew there was at least going to be two people here. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, a little bit overwhelming to see the interest uh, amongst all of you. So thank you very much for being here, and it's an absolute pleasure. So thank you, Dennis, and thanks, Pam, for the introduction. So um, we chose this topic, and there's a bit of history here because uh, stories can absolutely transform how we think about healthcare. And it's a potent tool that we can use in the healthcare system um, towards quality improvement. So I look forward to talking um, about storytelling with you. I do want to acknowledge that uh, we have some patient and family advisors here uh, within Alberta Health Services who have actually um, shared their stories with us. I want to acknowledge Karen Clack, Alicia Ellis, Rick Fraser, and Michelle Childs. Um, I don't know if you're here, but if you wanted to wave your hand, I uh, just want to thank you very much for being here. You know, it takes a lot of courage, actually, to share your stories, and I know that it was not easy um, to do, so thank you for your incredible response. And if you go to www.ahs.ca and type digital stories um, uh, into the search engine, you can actually see their stories uh, and many more. So as you have heard from Dr. Kunamoto, I have lots of personal and professional connections here with the University of Alberta and the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, and of course the Arts and Humanities and Health and Medicine program. So in many respects, it's like coming home tonight. Um, you know, Pam and I started the Arts and Humanities and Health and Medicine program back in 2006. And um, it's, it's just been very rewarding to see how Pam has actually, under her leadership, kept it going and kept it growing. Uh, so, you know, congratulations, Pam, for that. Um, so when Pam and I started the program, the major intention of AHHM was to really make sure that the students, our medical students, understood that healthcare is more than just information and knowledge. And we knew that with all the information that the medical students were getting taught, that it was all about technology and diagnostics and therapeutics, and we really felt that there was some gap in the medical curriculum and that there was a, there was a loss around human-to-human -human interaction. Um, we felt that there was a loss around trust, trusting relationships between healthcare providers, patients, clients, and families. Um, and so the whole purpose of the program was to really try to reinforce to our students that they should never lose sight of humanism, which is really at the heart of healthcare. So when I left um, the faculty in 2012 to join AHS, um, it was very rewarding for me to see that, in fact, storytelling was already there, very much in the early stages, very much burgeoning. But um, to see it progress over the last five years, I think, has been really, really uh, rewarding for us. This is a lovely quote because it really does express why we are all here tonight and why we are so interested in storytelling. Um, because, you know, we can ask all the questions around diagnosis, medications, but really it is the stories that leads to the real understanding of what drives uh, patients and families and why we get to know them better. So I wanted to share you with an experience about how a story made a difference um, in caring for this one individual. So within Alberta Health Services, uh, we have added more than what we call whiteboards. So more than 8,000 whiteboards across the province. And these are whiteboards that if you're a patient in a room, Right in front on the wall is going to be a white board, and on that board is going to be provided name of your uh, healthcare provider for that day. Maybe they would talk about some tests that are going to be going on. Um, and it's really meant to be an information board for the patient so that they know who's looking after them and what's going to happen. Part of the challenge, though, was adopting the uptake. You can imagine that with 8,000 boards, 8,000 practitioners, you're going to get a little bit of varied response, right, about who fills out what. And in fact, um, we weren't absolutely able to actually get some of the staff to even fill it out. Um, even though we were told by patients and families that whiteboards make a very positive difference uh, in their healthcare experience, it just wasn't enough to cement the experience. So uh, one day, on a particular unit, it came to this manager's attention that there was an elderly patient who noticed that on her whiteboard, uh, there was nothing written. So it was blank. And yet she could see on the other whiteboards for other patients 
that it was updated quite regularly. So what she thought was that she thought she was going to die. That she thought that there was nothing written on her whiteboard because she knew that it was just a matter of days. So she summed up the courage, because it takes courage, to ask her healthcare provider, um, why is it that my whiteboard is empty? Is it because I'm going to die? And the manager was taken aback, saying, oh my goodness, absolutely not. Um, you're, you're not well, but you're in good hands, and you're going to get better. Um, and it was through that story relayed to the staff. When the staff understood the impact of an empty whiteboard, I can tell you that in that unit, every single whiteboard um, had been filled out since. So that's kind of the power of storytelling, um, to say that it's more than just about the patient experience. It really is about what is the impact for that individual person. So as I said, um, storytelling within Alberta Health Services really began with the establishment of a patient and family advisory group. And this is a tremendous group of individuals who volunteer their time, bring their ideas and perspectives, and actually informs Alberta Health Services about our policies, our programs, our procedures, and make sure that everything is looked at through the lens of a patient and family member. And they really volunteer countless hours. I think we've done um, annual reports about the thousands of hours that they dedicate uh, to improving health care for all Albertans. And so it's through their stories and their experiences, which are, to be frank, both positive and more often than not negative, uh, that really fed into one of our four foundational strategies, which is the patient first strategy. So back in 2013, I was asked by the then CEO of Chris Eagle to really launch an you know, a, a organizational wide strategy on patient family centered care. And being a pediatric nephrologist, which is my clinical specialty, I couldn't understand why you needed to do that. Why do we actually have to develop a strategy where we have to treat patients and clients with respect and dignity? With kindness and compassion. Um, it really didn't make sense to me. And, but there was no question there was a need there. There's no question that, um, that we heard loud and clear that patients and families wanted to be respected. They wanted to be heard. They wanted to have a team. And they wanted to have seamless transition. So part of the patient first strategy in terms of rolling it out, very much a part of that is around the storytelling. So when we ask about stories from patients, we want to know what, when things go right, and we also want to know about when things go better, or could go better. And I just want to share a story with you um, about what the difference is uh, when it comes to my own personal experience. So as I was saying to you, I'm a children's kidney specialist, and one of the difficult times for our patients is the transition period, when they transition from our service over to the adult service. So I was rounding in the hospital, and uh, one of the adult kidney specialists saw me in the hallway and said, Verna, I need to talk to you about your patient. And it was a 17-year-old girl, and I knew her very well. We looked after her since she was a baby, so we knew the family extremely well. She was one of two siblings who both had kidney failure. Both of them were transplanted. This was a family who was an incredibly resilient family who, if you, if you could only cope with one child with kidney failure, let alone two with kidney failure, I mean, they were unbelievable um, parents. And so as part of our transition into the adult unit, um, you can understand how difficult it would be, how scary it would be for her to be in a unit um, that's very different from the one she had grown up in uh, for 17 years of her life. So I was thinking, well, you know, she's a really nice girl. Like, what on earth could possibly be wrong? And so I said to the adult nephrologist, I said, well, you know, well, tell me, you know, I'll go talk to her and see how things are going. But I just, for the life of me, could not fathom what was the issue. And the adult nephrologist said to me, you know, Verna, um, she's asking for her mom too much. And I'm thinking, what? She's, of course she's asking for her mother. She's 17, for goodness sakes. And uh, why should she not be asking for her mother? And um, the problem was is that they didn't know who she was. They didn't know her story. They didn't know her background. They didn't know the years of chronic disease that she had. They didn't understand the connection that she had with her, her mother and her father and her brother. Um, and it's because of that lack of knowledge that the care team really, I think, underestimated the importance of her family to her. And so for me, this is a really um, 
important illustration of how storytelling and understanding somebody's story actually impacts on someone's care. Because once you're labeled as being a problem, you can imagine um, what the rest of your hospital stay may be like. So within Alberta Health Services, we um, launched something called the Good News Initiative. Um, part of our challenge within the organization is really trying to relay out to our staff around um, good initiatives and good stories. We have a process uh, called the Patient Relations Office. And Patient Relations, if you go onto our website, right on the first part of the page, you can, if you have any issue, whether it's a good issue or a bad issue, you can click on that and you get onto Patient Relations. And I can share with you that most of the time, they tend to be bad news, they tend to be complaints, about 80% of the time. But 20% are actually really positive stories. And we know that this is not necessarily an accurate reflection uh, of how patients we serve feel about our work, um, because the commendations are often done informally too, not really formally through the website. So we really wanted to get out there around the Good News Initiative and we thought it was one of the ways that we could really formalize an informal commendation. Um, and, but it required a lot of work. Um, we had to contact patients, we had to get consents, we had to get the stories and we had to share them uh, throughout the organization through our internal website, uh, through our electronic newsletters and meetings of our staff and the Patient First Steering Committee. And initially we were worried that we wouldn't get enough stories out there. We were worried that we wouldn't be able to find the positive experiences, but let me tell you, um, it, there were too many. Um, we had um, incredible feedback. Um, things around uh, providing input into our frontline providers were commended. And many times the reaction from our frontline providers were one of surprise. They didn't realize that they were doing anything outside of the norm. Uh, they didn't realize that they earned any appreciation. Um, and they were very, very grateful uh, getting praise from the patients and families. Because we know that healthcare is a tough job. Healthcare is a stressful job. So anytime there's this type of uh, positive feedback, um, you can see how important it is up to the staff. It really does lead to rejuvenation, um, and it makes them motivated. It really helps our teams stay motivated. So we felt that the Good News Initiative was a really good start around storytelling, about getting the stories out to our crew, um, and that was a really powerful tool. Um, and then we got hearing more about more people wanting to get more storytelling. Um, and so this really started the path about moving forward to the next initiative, which is around digital storytelling. So I think I'm going to show a video, Samia, who's going to help me with this. Um, so we're going to show you um, one of our uh, YouTube videos, and it's entitled To Hell and Back. When I was 10 years old, my cousin took me for a ride on his 1972 Honda 250 on a frozen lake. I was hooked. One of my favorite places to ride and fly fish is the Highwood Pass. I feel totally free in the mountains, but three years ago, I thought I would lose all of it. I was in the shower one morning when I got screaming dizzy and I couldn't breathe. A little voice in my head said, you need to call 911 right now. 12 hours later, after an ambulance ride to the ER, a four-hour hallway wait, a chest x-ray, a CAT scan, IVs, oxygen, blood tests, and many doctors and nurses coming in and out of my room, I found out that I had a massive pulmonary embolism. A week later, I was recovering, but my legs were still puffed up like marshmallows. Despite this, they wanted me to go home. A condition of my release was that I had to learn to inject a drug into my stomach. As they were describing the process, I started to panic because I have an extreme fear of needles. Who would think a big tough biker would be scared of needles? I tried to explain to them that I couldn't do it. I was crying and freaking out, but they just kept saying, don't worry, you can handle it. You're a strong woman, you're tough. I remember one person screaming at me, this is to save your life. In the end, I could tell that no matter what I said, it was falling on deaf ears. I knew that I would not be able to do it by myself at home, but no one was listening to me. With my family doctor's help, 
I was able to get the community paramedic program to do the injections for me. However, a few weeks later, I had another blood clot in my foot and I was immediately admitted to the hospital for two emergency surgeries. One of them was to remove all the toes on my left foot. As I laid in my bed recovering, a spiritual care guy walked into my room. I gave him a hard time because I really didn't want to face my own mortality. However, he was persistent and eventually I realized he was just there to listen to me. I told him how worried I was that I wouldn't be able to shift gears on my bike and I would never be able to ride again. After he left, I felt like I had been listened to. Two weeks later, he came back with some photos of motorbikes and fly fishing in the mountains. He put them up on the wall and kept coming in to visit me throughout my recovery. He went above and beyond to find out what was important to me. Those visits and the photos on the wall made me determined to figure out how I was gonna get back on my bike and fish again. Two years later, I was able to get floorboards for my bike and a prosthetic to help me shift, and I got to ride through the Highwood Pass. As I opened up the throttle, I remember thinking that when you are riding your bike, the louder the pipes, the more people pay attention. But I don't think that's the way healthcare should operate. So, <clears throat> so, as you can see, we don't sugarcoat the experiences. Um, you can see that uh, we want really the straight, the unvarnished truth from our subjects, our patients, our family advisors. We want good experiences and we want the bad experiences. Um, because there's much to learn from both. And as you can see from Shelley's experiences, there were good and bad. Um, and it reminds us that we need to vi view the individual as a whole. That it's just not about the toes, it's just not about the, the gangrene in her feet, it's really about her as a person. You know, what were her dreams, what are her fears? Um, what do we need to understand that person as a whole person for us to truly care for them? Um, I did an interview for Mike Lang, I think Mike Lang is here, uh, when he was doing um, a series on storytelling, and I said in the interview with him that, you know, when we see patients, the first thing we say often in clinic is, you know, what's the matter with you? Right? What's the matter with you? And really, we need to switch it, and we need to say, you know, what matters to you? And it's just a substitution of, like, two little words. You know, really, what matters to you? And I think if you don't understand that, if we didn't understand that about Shelley, if you didn't understand what was important to her, um, then how do you look after her? How do you actually keep her from being in a state of depression because you know, her fear was that she could never ride a motorbike again? And so you know, the spiritual care advisor really listened to her. And was it really going out of his way to put pictures of a motorbike or a fly fishing on the wall of her hospital room? No question, these were simple acts of kindness and compassion. Um, and it's sad to say that you know, it, we consider that we're going out of the way to do that. You know, and the spiritual care advisor lifted her spirits beyond uh, what we would have expected with any medication. Couldn't have given her any medication to do that, and yet it was just these photographs. So these are just the sort of stories that we want to share with everyone who works in the healthcare system, because I suspect when they see this video, they're never going to forget it. And it really is those random acts of kindness that makes the ultimate difference for a patient experience. And that is the power of storytelling. So when we launched um, digital storytelling in 2016, and to date we've produced about 34 videos that really addresses a wide range of healthcare experiences. So there's really applicability across all service areas. It's not just about acute inpatient care. We know we have stories around seniors care. We've got adolescents, uh, young adults. And really it's through these videos that we are now better to, but now we are now better meet the growing demand for patient storytelling because we couldn't keep up. There were too many asks. We didn't, we didn't have enough patient family advisors, uh, and I know that they themselves felt that they were spread too thin. So when we don't, when it is not possible for an advisor to speak in person or to routinely work with a committee, we actually use these digital stories to help our people learn from and reflect 
about patient and family experiences. We have many clinical nurse educators, educators in general, who are now incorporating their videos in their curriculum. And our plan for 2018 is to really take these 34 and really get out uh, to show our frontline staff, and that's a really important goal for us. Digital storytelling uh, encourages moments of reflection for our teams and our staff, and I know that by better reflection, it will lead to improved patient outcomes and experiences, and absolutely uh, improved health provider experiences. So in fact, our quality team produced a digital story themselves, focusing on one of our healthcare administrators on how a moment of reflection and uh, Samia, I'm going to call her up, of really how a moment of reflection and clarity really reinvigorated her and reminded her of why she chose to work in healthcare. I got married when I was 21, and soon after, we packed our belongings into seven hockey bags, boarded a Greyhound bus to Montreal, and I started my training as a social worker. This is where my journey into healthcare really began. Over the past 20 years, I have provided frontline care, led operational teams, and eventually have transitioned into strategic level positions. There was always lots of work to be done, and it was easy to get caught up in the policies, the procedures, the deadlines, and the lists of urgent tasks. I didn't notice it happening, but working every day in this environment slowly was disconnecting me from the reason why I got into healthcare in the first place. In the summer of 2016, I was reminded. My mother-in-law went into the hospital for a routine hysterectomy. Unfortunately, things did not go as planned and she suffered a perforated bowel during the surgery. Within 24 hours, she went into septic shock and multi-organ failure. We were called into the hospital to say our goodbyes. Before I left, I packed my suitcase with funeral clothes, anticipating that we would lose her. When I walked into the ICU for the first time, I was overwhelmed. I barely recognized her between the swelling, tubes, monitoring machines, and medication lines. It was a blur of activity to watch the care team work on her. She was cold, swollen, and unconscious. In the haze of those days, I clearly remember the actions of one nurse. While my mom was unconscious, we watched him talk to her as if she were listening and fully aware. His touch was gentle and his tone was calm and caring. He spoke to her throughout his shifts, telling her exactly what he was doing, what he was noticing on the machines and the medications he was adjusting. He cared for her like she was the only one on his mind. Not only was it comforting to watch him treat her with such dignity, but I see now that it also gave us hope and communicated important information to us as a family. In those moments, I saw firsthand how healthcare providers don't just save lives, they change lives. The actions of that one nurse helped me to reconnect with why I am in healthcare. I want to be a part of a system where every interaction has a person at the center of it. So Deanna's story really tells us how many of us can get disconnected uh, being in healthcare. And her comments, I'm sure, resonates with many of us who are in the healthcare field because we know about compassion fatigue. We know about the potential burnout for our staff um, because it grinds you, right? It can drain you of your compassion uh, and empathy. And so, you know, in many respects, a video like this can perhaps can serve as a reminder of why we're in healthcare in the first place. So storytelling really brings to the forefront a very much of an emotional piece of what we do. Uh, and by doing so, we believe that everyone in Alberta Health Services, not just the care providers, but those who actually support the care, will remember that we don't care for patients or home care clients or continuing care residents or visitors to our public health facilities. We care for Albertans. We care for parents and grandparents, for brothers and sisters, for husbands and wives, for friends and neighbors. We care for people who all have their unique stories to tell 
and their own expectations for the health systems. And you know, for many of these Albertans, they don't want or expect their healthcare providers to perform cartwheels. Uh, they basically want kindness, respect, consideration. They want to be heard. They want to feel like they're at the center of their healthcare team. And they want to know that their voice matters. So in essence, that really is the core of patient and family-centered care. So I hope that you get a chance to see our digital stories. I think they send a very strong message that Alberta Health Services cares about what happens to the people that we serve, that we are a learning organization that wants to see how we can improve, and that yes, patients and families are involved in our planning programs, uh, in our services, in developing policy, in designing our infrastructure, and really everything that we do within the organizations. And that the digital stories are a very good educational tool for Albertans. They show the complexity of the healthcare system, but also the complexities of being a patient or becoming a family member who's sick. And I believe that through watching our digital stories, that people can learn a lot about what it means to be a patient, but also what it means to be a healthcare provider. So, um, Robert McKee is a creative writing instructor and author of a very influential guide to screenwriting and says that storytelling is really the most powerful way to put ideas into the world today. But really, it is the most powerful way to put ideas into the world. Uh, humans are wired for storytelling. It's long historical context. I mean, why else would humans feel concern and empathy for characters in a work of fiction that don't exist? I mean, I honestly still cry if I watch Bambi and see the death of the mother. Um, when you read a book and you can't put it down because you feel connected to the characters, and honestly, if the story is compelling enough, you know, these characters live through us and with us. And we often turn to these fictional characters for guidance and strength or wisdom. So within healthcare, doesn't it make sense that storytelling enables us then to bring a human face to illness and injury? So when we talk about Mrs. Smith in Unit 34 with cardiac disease and diabetes, it's not so much that she's got diabetes and hypertension, uh, but she's a grandmother of five and a retired school teacher who loves to bake. And when we talk about Shelley, it's not so much that she had a pulmonary embolism and needed to have her foot amputated, it's that she loves to ride motorcycles and fly fish. And even though she's got a tough exterior, she's got Ashley uh, soft interior. And when we know these details about patients, it's not about what matters with them, but what matters to them. We're in such a better place to actually look after patients and families. So storytelling is but one way for us to shift our thinking. And we know that research shows that people who speak a common language when they share stories and that this helps everyone involved make sense sometimes of often difficult and traumatic situations. Our storytelling capacity has grown in many years, and I'm pleased to see that we have other AHS departments, as well as our external partners, have jumped on board themselves. So uh, we're going to show you uh, another video. I think this is maybe our last one. Um, and this is actually a video um, uh, from one of our foundations. care for it. Uh, so they were called the facility, got some IV access going. I 
I saw a patient this morning with that name. Why don't we Is the pain starting to subside? Yeah. No. Bed management, Michelle speaking. Okay. What's the patient's name? McIntyre. All right, that's a compassionate bed. Let me see what I can do. You guys need help? Follow this hallway down there and follow the signs to Robin's family. So please don't move an inch Don't ever change a thing Just let me take this in And hold it tight Why don't we wait here? No We grew up together. Why don't we wait? And we will we'll die together. I just wanna stay here. Why don't we wait here? No. I can't actually watch it because I get choky when I. <laughs> so I notice I was kept my head down. Um, this was actually uh, an award winning uh, video that was done by the Royal Alex Hospital Foundation about two years ago. And it really was aimed to use storytelling to show people the difference between providing care and truly caring for patients and families. And as a consequence of that, we've actually launched our own Because You Cared series. And these videos really uh, were launched to really showcase Albertans thanking their healthcare teams for exceptional and often life-saving and life-changing care. The videos have been really popular with our staff and physicians and volunteers, but also with Albertans and actually have been viewed um, more than a million times. So if they're on our website, but they're also on our AHS channel on YouTube. Did you know that there was a... AHS channel on YouTube. Um, I guess you do now. Uh, so if you want to take a look. And in fact, we're actually making some inroads about, you know, um, engaging patients, working al alongside clinicians and researchers and policy makers, so that as we drive research and innovation, patients are at the forefront of any of the decisions that are made. So um, I just want to also say that, you know, there has been some symposiums and forums where we really brought uh, patients and family advisors in collaboration with experts, um, physicians, nurses, healthcare administrators, scientists, uh, where patients and families share stories of their experiences as members, not only of the audience, but also actually within the panel. And I just want to share some comments uh, from patients from those sessions. One said, you know, I was comforted by people I didn't know, and it was horrible because all I wanted was my brother. If the staff had asked, who do you want here, um, I would have sent my brother, and my healthcare experience would have been different. And this one remark really resonated with a nurse in the audience for one of these sessions, um, and really does transform the way uh, when we actually ask the questions about what matters to you, uh, instead of making assumptions. And these types of events have been sponsored by the Canadian Institute for Health Research, along with the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group, and our own Critical Care SCNs, and I think it's through these types of dialogues that really encourages our academic colla collaborations uh, with the universities as well as our partners um, where we can actually learn from the people that we serve. So this is the way that we practice healthcare within Alberta Health Services. Uh, it's not a new thing. It's more of a way of being. We're trying to blend storytelling in with our big initiatives around team-based care and collaborative practice. And we're sharing patient and family stories because we know they foster an understanding and empathy about what it means when we're sick, what it means to be at the most vulnerable in our period. It reminds us all that we are all patients and families ourselves uh, and that we should not 
treat anybody any different uh, than how we would treat our own family members. It's about understanding that every person that we serve has a story, that every person that we serve has extenuating <coughs> circumstances that we need to understand, and that we need to understand the personal situation in order to provide truly holistic care. We need to understand all of these. And in my own field as a children's kidney specialist, if I didn't understand the family situation, how the family supports um, providing dialysis for a baby, how on earth can our team provide care for that individual and for the family and to support them? There's a woman by the name of Josephine Billings who was a longtime volunteer advocate for improving health care in New York, New York. And she passed away in 2002, I think at the age of 90, 97. And she said a quote that I honestly, I have to say, is my favorite quote. Um, she said, you know, to the world, you may be one person, but to the one person, you may be the world. And that in itself says it all. You know, healthcare is a privilege to be in. I've always said that I've been very, very lucky in my life to actually have the privilege uh, to be a healthcare practitioner. Patients and families entrust us with information that they wouldn't even share with each other. And yet we are in that position of trust sometimes without even really spending a lot of time with people. And what we do with that privilege really boils down to decisions that we make as healthcare workers. And we need to model good behaviors and we need to model good decisions. And storytelling is a compelling way for us to do that. And as a tool, there isn't a policy or a technology that can do more to promote an understanding of patient family-centered care uh, throughout our health system. So I wanna say thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for your interest in storytelling. And I'm not gonna answer all 300 questions, but I'll try to answer a few. Thank you so much.